And they proved many theorems in the 17th century, no application in mind. And then more than 350 years later, uh, they, in the late 70s last, of last century, uh, it has been understood how to use prime numbers, so how to use number theory from, for cryptography. So to encrypt data that then you can send in the internet, you can send through the web, you can send in many ways and are protected. Welcome, welcome to Calonia Podcast, a podcast about the use of scientific discoveries and of technology applications. We provide the best information on projects participated by Calonia and many more. My name is Gabriella Bernardi, I'm a science journalist, and in today's episode we talk about the ubiquity of mathematics with Alessio Figalli, director of the mathematical research at the ETH Zurich and the Fields Medal in 2018. It's a very pleasure to meet you. And uh, would you please uh, briefly introduce uh, yourself for those uh, who don't know you already? Hi, nice to see you and uh, nice to talk to you. So um, my name is Alessio Figalli. I'm a mathematician, Italian mathematician, born in Rome. Uh, and since six years, I'm a professor of mathematics at ETH Zurich. Uh, currently, I'm also the director of the Research, research Institute uh, DTH Zurich, which is in mathematics. And uh, uh, yeah, I won the Fields Medal in 2018 for my work on mathematics and more specifically on optimal transport. Perfect. Uh, professor, during your career, you won a lot of prizes. How did this influence your work? So prizes, uh, you know, uh, on the one end, they give recognition to your work. So this is something that uh, when you receive them, you feel very proud of. And also you know that you're doing uh, the right job. You know that you are on the right path. You know that the mathematical community value your research. So, of course, they are extremely uh, motivational. Uh, on the one end, so it's a recognition. On the other end, uh, it's... Uh, it gives also uh, energy for the future because uh, it's like, uh, uh, you know, this kind of uh, support that you're receiving tells you, okay, you're on the right path, keep doing like that, things are going well. So they go in both directions, right? So it's an some, it's something to which you want to arrive, but also it's a, a starting point for keep doing the best possible research. Sure. Pure math and applied math. Can you comment and give us some example about the relation between them? Yeah, so mathematics is often described as being the union, let's say, of two different uh, kind of mathematics. So there is the pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Uh, pure mathematics is really the mathematics a bit abstract without an immediate application. So you just do for the sake of knowledge because you want to understand how mathematics work. You want to build uh, new theories because of their beauty, because of the connection to other theories, because they just make sense uh, from a research viewpoint. On the other hand, when you do more applied math, you have something very specific in mind in general. You have a concrete problem in mind and this guides your research. Uh, this could be something that can be done in short time, perhaps a problem to which you want to give an answer in less than a year, or perhaps it takes more time. Uh, of course, as a mathematician, it's impossible to give a universal answer to a problem in less than a year, because usually this requires every math result requires many years of work. But in, sense in, in applied math, you're also satisfied often with, let's say, some important but partial answer because they're good enough for the problem you want to study. Now, it would be wrong and short-sighted to think that you can you can have one without the other. Uh, history has proved us that many applications that we see in our life exist because there was pure math behind it. Still, you need applied math to transform perhaps mathematical ideas into something very applicable, so something that perhaps engineers can use later or so on. But you need the theory which is behind, a, a, a solid mathematical theory. And this is done usually by pure math. And to just give a very simple example, 
mathematician worked for many years on number theory. They studied prime numbers for many, many years because of their beauty, because of their structure. They just wanted to understand numbers, how numbers behave under operations. And they proved many theorems in the 17th century, no application in mind. And then more than 350 years later, uh, they, in the late 70s last, of last century, uh, it has been understood how to use prime numbers, so how to use number theory for, for cryptography. So to encrypt data that then you can send in the internet, you can send through the web, you can send in many ways and are protected. Um, so this is a clear example where you needed certain some applied math mind to transform pure theorems into applications, but the, the theorems had to be there because otherwise you would not have the, the technology. So they, they have to go together. There is no, no way around it. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, now, can you explain how math drives innovation? Well, the way math drives innovation is uh, in many ways, right? So um, mathematicians have always tried to describe nature, to describe the world through numbers. And in reality, this math mathematics is a universal language that allows to to understand physics, to understand chemistry, to understand biology, but also to build technology. Because for instance, uh, you know, mathematicians uh, in the 18th century wanted to describe, uh, understand heat propagation. They wanted to understand how the heat propagates, for instance, when you shoot into a, with a cannon. So this was military study. And mathematicians just were studying the theoretical aspect of it because they thought it was interesting. And through this study, one of the years later, we built um, digital um, recordings, uh, digital uh, uh, media. We, it's all based on mathematics. Uh, so uh, mathematics just, it's behind all the innovational, only innovation we have, because that's really the language, how innovation works. I mean, computers work with, so that's logic and mathematics behind it. Uh, that's how our cell phone works. That's how our, everything works in reality. <laughs> and also when you want just to build, you know, a bridge, you want to build anything, even constructions, you have to do mathematical computation to make sure that things don't collapse. So, uh, you know, mathematics has always been behind every kind of innovation. For sure, now we see it more and more. Now in this current area, for instance, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence. We talk a lot about um, data science and the using data and, uh, you know, for many, many things, uh, self-driving cars. And all these questions in the end can be translated into mathematical problems. Very difficult ones, very challenging ones. Uh, of course, you know, it, it will take many years to have a, a solid and complete mathematical answer to these problems. Uh, probably more times than the, the uh, than the speed at which application uh, you know of which technology will develop because often technology goes a bit faster. Uh, but in the end, everything exists because of mathematics. Professor Figali, what are you working now? Uh, I work on a variety of problems. So on the one problem which is very dear to me is the optimal transport problem. This consists in transporting resources from one place to another in the um, cheapest possible way. So it looks like an economical problem, you know, moving mass from one place to another in a cheap way is can be used for instance in urban planning when you want to build a city and try to make sure that you can transport resources in the most efficient way. But it has connections to many other areas. Uh, I studied personally, for instance, to understand how cloud moves in the air, so cloud movements. There is an optimal transport in the way clouds move. Uh, in a sense, the particles that compose the clouds try to minimize energy, as that happens often in nature. But it's not only that. Right now, people use it, for instance, in, in machine learning, because you can transport pixels between one image and another. And this is an optimal transport. So you can use this to understand images, to recognize uh, images. Um, so this is one. Another thing that is worked on a lot in the last years is called uh, uh, phase transition problem. So essentially you have, for instance, ice and water. You put ice inside the water, the ice starts to melt, and you want to understand how the melting process occur. So there is this melting from ice to water. And you just want to describe this phenomenon. It looks very classical, still very delicate. It's very complicated because the ice 
of course, if the ice is just a cube, it's very easy to see that the cube just melts until it disappears. But if you have more complicated geometries of your ice, uh, maybe the, the ice can first split into smaller and smaller blocks in the melting process. And the way this breaking of ice happens and this splitting happens is actually extremely delicate to study mathematically. So these are just two of the problems on which I've been working on. Very interesting. And uh, in your opinion, which are the biggest challenges for the next generation of mathematics? So for sure, mathematics is going very, very quick. Um, on the one hand, I would say that the, on the pure side, we are still studying a lot of very classical questions. I mean, right now I'm still studying the melting of ice into water. Uh, this is a problem that was formulated at the end of the 19th century, so more than 130 years ago, actually. And still we are understanding things. There are still many things to be understood of these models because they are extremely complicated. So there are a variety of very classical and let's say a bit abstract, but you know, with concrete, uh, unless with concrete questions in mind, but still abstract models that we want to study, melting, freezing, all these phenomena. Many questions about fluids, how the fluids move in a tube. There are so many questions about fluid dynamics that still mathematicians cannot answer to. Uh, on the other end, what is clear is that there will be more and more, there will be more and more research driven by applications. In particular, artificial intelligence right now is a source of a variety of new math problems that will interest mathematicians. So in some sense, I can see a lot of work on the classical mathematics, all the questions that have been around now for 100 years and still are unanswered because um, you know th there are many, many challenging problems. On the other end, new questions are coming in because technology naturally is connected to mathematics and mathematics needs to develop more and more to answer to these questions. And this goes a bit back to the pure and applied mathematics. This, apl this application influence mathematics, bring new questions. This will drive applied mathematics, but also uh, this will give also work to pure mathematicians because it naturally um, inspires new questions. So I would say this is the, the, there is no, there are many big challenges, but in some sense, nothing they will, on the pure, on the applied side is clear where the new things will arrive from. On the pure side, I think it will be just be going on what people have already been doing. And the good thing is that this kind of research that mathematicians have been working on during the last 50 more years have been extremely relevant for many applications in a posteriori. So I think all goes together in, into, again, the same big uh, uh, picture. Fantastic. Now we are at the end of this podcast, but last but not least, uh, which skill learner has an under undergraduate student to serve you best during your career? For sure, uh, one thing that you, one needs to, to learn as an undergraduate is how to study. So it's not really just the, the knowledge, because knowledge is changing so quickly. It's um, critical thinking. But also the learning, for instance, as a mathematician, we learn a lot about, about abstraction. So having a problem and try to break it to, into sub-problems on one end, or also try to see it as part of a more com bigger problem. So like, oh, this, this is in reality a particular case of something else, perhaps which looks more complicated, but the moment you make it more abstract, perhaps it's more treatable. So there is the critical thinking, the way of attacking problems that is, is how to study, how to efficiently learn new skills, how to efficiently learn new techniques, everything. Because the world is changing, the knowledge changes a lot. What will be needed perhaps in 20 years from now will be different than what we need now. And so it's important to keep like a elastic brain in some sense that is trained to, to keep up uh, with, uh, with the society and with uh, the knowledge and the skills that will be needed in the future. So this, uh, I would say, is definitely very important. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Figali, for joining us today at this podcast. And thanks to our listeners. If you have any question about today's show, you can get in touch on Filonia Twitter and feel free to subscribe to Filonia.swiss website and be part of the community. In the meantime, stay tuned for our next interview. Thank you again, Professor. 
Thank you. My pleasure.